Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and I'm very pleased uh, to be uh, able to welcome you to this um, uh, Institute of International and European Affairs event. It's part of the Global Europe um, project, which is uh, supported uh, by the Department of uh, Foreign uh, Affairs. And uh, the aim of that project is to analyze and to communicate um, to the wider public um, the debate on the future of Europe, on the European Union's role uh, in the world, and indeed on Ireland's role in the multilateral um, order. Um, we are honored and uh, delighted uh, to be joined uh, today uh, by uh, Mr. Justice uh, Frank uh, Clark, who, as we all know, uh, was Chief Justice of Ireland uh, from 2017 to 2021, and uh, who has been uh, kind and generous enough to take uh, time out of uh, what I understand is still an enormously busy schedule um, uh, to speak to us today about the rule of law uh, in, the, uh, in the European Union. Uh, the plan uh, is that uh, Mr. Justice Clark will speak to us uh, for about 20 to 25 minutes, uh, and then we will move on to a question and answer uh, a session with our audience. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion using the question question and answer uh, function on Zoom, uh, which you should be able to see um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free uh, to send your questions uh, throughout the session uh, as they occur to you, and we'll come to them once Judge Clark uh, has concluded uh, with his presentation. Uh, if I could please request you uh, to keep your questions uh, as brief uh, as possible uh, in that way, uh, we can get to as many uh, as possible uh, during uh, the event. Um, uh, may I uh, remind you also that uh, today's presentation uh, and uh, the questions and answers that follow it uh, are both uh, on the record and uh, the address will be uploaded to the Institute's um, website and to YouTube. Um, uh, we'd also encourage our guests uh, in this technological age to, uh, to tweet uh, using the handle at IIEA. Um, uh, and uh, we're also uh, live streaming uh, this afternoon's discussion. So very warm welcome also uh, to all of you who are actually joining us uh, via YouTube. Um, I'd now um, uh, like to formally uh, introduce uh, Mr. Justice Clark, and then without any further ado, um, I will hand the floor over to him. Um, Mr. Justice uh, Frank Clark um, was, uh, as I've already mentioned, Chief Justice of Ireland uh, from July 2017 to October 2021. Um, he was called to the Bar of Ireland in 1973 uh, and to the inner bar um, in 1985, um, uh, appointed a, a judge uh, of the High Court in 2004. Uh, he was made a judge of the Supreme Court uh, subsequently in 2012. Um, he was the ACA um, uh, Europe correspondent for the Supreme Court from 2013 uh, uh, for eight years and was a vice president uh, of the network of the presidents of the Supreme Judicial Courts of the European uh, Union. Uh, he has also um, uh, taken a strong uh, interest in matters academic, always a, a good sign, and is uh, um, a, a former um, uh, uh, has uh, formerly taught law uh, at uh, King's Inns, was uh, an adjunct uh, professor of Trinity College Dublin and also of University um, College Cork, in addition to being a judge in residence at uh, Griffith College. Um, he's a member of the distinguished uh, and very vital uh, panel provided for in Article 255 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which provides an opinion uh, on the appointment of judges uh, and indeed advocates general uh, to the Court of Justice of the European Union. We're delighted uh, to have him here with us today. And uh, Chief Justice, uh, um, I will now, uh, if I may, pass the floor uh, over to yourself. <coughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be able to participate in this very valuable programme and to offer some observations on the challenges to the rule of law and issues surrounding the rule of law in Europe, uh, issues which have become uh, quite topical in recent times for reasons with which we are all familiar. Um, of course, those challenges are many and operate across a whole range of different areas, including the political, with the growth of populism uh, and necessary that we do not ignore uh, the reasons for those developments and in particular the reasons why they have fed into challenges uh, to the rule of law. Uh, so if I concentrate on other issues it's not because I do not consider those matters to be particularly important but rather that I feel that as uh, someone who has spent his whole life as a practicing lawyer and as you've mentioned, the last 17 years as a serving judge in a national court, there are perhaps particular aspects of the issue on which I might be able uh, to uh, bring to bear some expertise. My views on more general issues are probably no more developed than any avid reader of the newspapers. And I want to concentrate on, on two main issues, uh, which I think are, are of importance um, and perhaps have not been emphasized 
uh, in all of the debate to date. The first um, is a possible distinction between an issue which has come to the fore over the last two or so years, being what might be perceived to be challenges to the primacy of EU law from the perspective of certain Apex national courts. Now, obviously, technically speaking, the primacy of EU law is not the same issue as the rule of law, but they do overlap to some extent, and the issues they give rise to frequently occur in the same context. So I think it's a matter well worth exploring at this stage. And secondly, the importance from the perspective of each national court within the European Union of respect for the rule of law in the national courts of each other member state. It's sometimes been said that, well, in one sense, it's none of our business what's happening in other countries. And I'd like to demonstrate why, from the perspective of a national court, what is happening in the courts of other member states is a matter of significant importance to us, both as a general proposition, but also in certain very specific ways. And if I might return to question one, um, and that's the question of the prim of primacy of European Union law, I'd just like to make a couple of preliminary observations, lest anything I say might be misunderstood and I might be considered uh, to be drifting towards a Eurosceptic wing uh, on, on these issues. I have to make confessions. I'm old enough that I actually canvassed in the 1972 referendum uh, to join the European Union. Uh, that's a grave admission on my part. <laughs> um, and i have come back to that referendum and, uh, and the wording of the constitutional amendment that came about as a result of it. Uh, but I've always been uh, strongly uh, in favour of the European Union. Uh, and therefore, I wouldn't like anything I say um, to be taken to imply anything uh, to the contrary. Uh, but secondly, I also understand and fully accept importance of the primacy of European Union law in the context of maintaining the coherence of what has in recent times come to be called the European legal space. Um, and I might just touch on why that's important before going on to identify what may be a problem that needs further exploration. Um, obviously, European Union law is by and large the same in all member states. Sometimes there is room for a degree of flexibility. Uh, for example, some countries have protocol exemptions from particular uh, provisions of, of European Union law. And we, of course, in Ireland uh, have the benefit, for example, of Protocol uh, 21 in respect of the area uh, of freedom, security, and justice. Um, and also, many European directives do confer a certain flexibility on the member states as to how they are to implement the requirements of the directive. So that in itself uh, contemplates the possibility that the detail of the law may be so different between member states. But nonetheless, the coherence of the European Union legal system, the European legal space, it does require that within the limits of what's permitted either by the treaties and their protocols or the scope of flexibility conferred by directive. The law is the same whether it's been applied in Dublin or in Madrid or in Riga. And measures that might allow for a deviation beyond that which is permitted have the real possibility of creating different and incompatible results. When I come to question two, uh, part of what I will be addressing is the need that there is some court that makes a final decision on every issue of practicality between parties, and everyone has to recognise that. Uh, but likewise, if there is the real risk that the same issue may be decided differently by different courts, then that challenges the coherence of the European legal space. Um, so I, I fully accept and understand that as a matter of an imperative at European Union level. Uh, the law has to be the same in all member states, subject to whatever legitimate latitude the law itself confers. And while it may be a, 
slightly extreme example, we've come perhaps in recent years to realise that what seemed like extreme examples uh, do have a tendency to come more to pass in the current era than perhaps might have been the case in the past. And <clears throat> just imagine this, it's often said, well, what about national constitution? Surely they should have a role in deciding the parameters of what's permitted and not just European Union law. But it's not beyond the bounds of possibility and perhaps the more realistic proposition in, in the current climate, that if a, a member state were opposed to a measure being considered by the union legislatures, perhaps one adopted by qualified majority voting, the Council of Ministers, which that member state opposed uh, and passed by the parliament, assuming it to be co-legislation. Um, if that member state were, for example, to amend its constitution to say we don't like that sort of thing, and then say, well, we don't therefore have to comply with that European Union legal provision because our constitution doesn't permit it, one can readily see how there could be a very rapid unraveling of the coherence of the European Union legal space. So I mentioned these matters because I want to indicate that I strongly agree with all those propositions. And of course, the legal position from the perspective of European Union law is clear, going back to seminal cases such as Van Gendel Noos over a half a century ago, which made clear that as a matter of European Union law, uh, the European Union law is uh, prime, it has primacy. But while that much is clear, I think there is an issue which is now coming into some focus and which would bear um, much greater consideration and perhaps study and investigation, which is the status that the constitutions of member states confers on European Union law. Not from the perspective of the European Union institutions themselves, but rather from the perspective of national constitutions. And in that context, it's perhaps important to look at the national court systems, they vary an awful lot, as we know. Some countries, we're probably in a minority of a single Supreme Court, which deals with everything. But more commonly, um, member states have a separate constitutional court or tribunal. Um, and it is often said, and is true to a significant extent, that all of the courts of member states are, to an extent, European Union courts. Um, one of the significant distinctions between the European Union and the United States, for example, is that we do not have a system of European Union local courts. If you're involved, um, as I hope you won't be, in a major dispute of a financial variety arising out of Wall Street uh, involving federal law, your case will be heard by uh, the federal courts uh, for the Southern District of New York, which encompasses Manhattan and we'll go through the, the US Circuit of Appeals and to the Supreme Court if necessary. The model in Europe is of course different. The vast majority of cases applying on a day-to-day -day basis European Union law happen in national courts, which are required to apply European Union law. There is no uh, European Union court for the district of the Western Islands, including uh, that part of Ireland, which is part of the European Union. Um, so in that sense, all courts within the European Union member states are, are European Union courts. But there's another sense in which that's not completely so, because the courts are created by, one might say, are creatures of their own national constitutions. There is nothing in the treaties that provides for there being a Supreme Court in Ireland or a High Court or a Cour de Cassation or a Bundesverfassungsgericht or whatever. Each of those courts are created by their own constitution uh, and are given their competences or jurisdictions by their own constitutions. And while it may be a matter more of form than of substance, it's interesting that the words of the declaration which an Irish judge makes on taking up office is to uphold the constitution and the laws, no mention of the treaty, as it were. So that brings perhaps into focus the possibility that national constitutions recognize greater or lesser extent the primacy of European Union law. 
And clearly, to the extent that that may be lesser, that creates a potential conflict between the position in European Union law, where Union law is primate, and the position potentially in at least some member states, where that might not be quite so clear from the perspective of the national constitution. Um, perhaps it's worth starting with the Irish example in that we're perhaps outliers in two different directions. Um, <clears throat> the European Union treaties are, of course, international treaties, uh, apart from creating perhaps a rather unique set of legal structures. But the position generally of international treaties in the Irish constitution is quite interesting in that Article 29.6 of the Constitution uh, provides that international treaties do not have the force of law domestically unless so ordained by the Oireachtas. Uh, and that has been applied by the courts going back to the, the lawless or old lawless case in the 1950s. So that Irish law does recognize the possibility that Ireland may be in breach of an international law obligation uh, as a result of contracting into treaty obligations because the Oireachtas hasn't chosen to adopt the domestic measures that are required to implement that treaty obligation. Uh, and therefore, the possibility of a dis difference uh, between international law and domestic law is itself fully recognized in the Irish Constitution. Now, there are many measures adopted to minimize the risk of that happening, and it would be not common that it could be recognized as happening in practice. Firstly, of course, if Ireland signs a treaty, care will undoubtedly be given by than relevant authorities to seek to ensure that Irish law is brought into conformity with any treaty obligations being undertaken. And that's why sometimes it takes a while to ratify treaties, because legislation may need to be adopted to ensure that Ireland is in a position to comply with its obligation. And secondly, the courts have for many years adopted a policy of attempting where possible to interpret uh, Irish law perhaps implementing legislative measures and the like, uh, so as to bring Irish law into conformity with the treaty obligations that Ireland has adopted on the principle that it must be assumed that it was intended <coughs> when Ireland adopted those measures uh, that Ireland would comply with its international treaty obligations. But nonetheless, the possibility remains that there will be a distinction between an international treaty obligation which Ireland has undertaken on the one hand and domestic law on the other. And that possibility perhaps is all the greater in rights-based treaties where the understanding of the rights may evolve over time and where therefore what may now be considered to be covered by those rights-based obligations may be somewhat different than what might have been considered to be the case at the time the international treaty was originally entered into. But that's perhaps for another day. But the important point from purpose of my uh, uh, lecture today is the possibility exists directly under the Irish constitution for there being a difference between what international law requires of Ireland and what Ireland does domestically. We are in what's sometimes called the dualist system where international law does not have automatic status in the domestic field. Many other countries have a different position and to a greater or lesser extent recognize international law obligations as part of the domestic law. So there's a range of ways in which countries generally and the member states of the European Union in particular uh, give recognition to international treaties. But then if we move to the, those treaties which are of most relevance to the discussion today, the EU treaties, we're in fact on the other end of the scale. In the other provisions of Article 29, uh, provide, in effect, for the supremacy of European Union law. And to go back to that original uh, 1972 referendum leading to our accession uh, at the beginning of 1973, the wording that was included in that constitutional amendment has in substance been repeated in each of the subsequent amendments, which were necessitated by the Crotty decision 
uh, and which have followed on from further treaty changes conferring greater jurisdiction or competence uh, on the, the EC, European Community, and subsequently the European Union. Uh, and the wording generally says that nothing in the Constitution can render invalid measures which are necessitated by membership of the European Union. So in our constitutional regime, uh, the position of European Union law is expressly recognized and is expressly recognized in a way which seems to confer primacy on European Union law. There has sometimes been a small debate about whose job it is to interpret the word necessitated. In other words, is that a matter for the CJEU or could the Irish courts take their own view? Um, I think the majority view would certainly be that part of the treaties themselves confers on the CJEU the, the role of determining the validity of measures adopted by the union and therefore by signing up to the union, as it were, you sign up to the decision of the CJEU <coughs> on validity issues. Uh, and that therefore, if the CJEU says something is necessitated, that means that it is necessitated by definition as a matter of European Union law, but that's again, perhaps a debate that hasn't been well developed and, and may never need to be developed. But I suppose the principal point emerging from all that is that there is a di distinction uh, between the way in which national constitutions treat international treaties and particularly European Union treaties. The German Constitutional Court famous decision in May of last year on the EC bond uh, issue is a case in point. It's attracted a lot of attention, but I think it is fair to say that that court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, had previously indicated that it did not consider that in all circumstances, the German constitution was overridden by the primacy of European Union law. It had never actually found a measure to be one which the German institutions were not allowed to apply before that, but it had certainly accepted the principle. And there've been some indications from other courts in recent times along the same line. So altogether, apart from the recent Polish decision, there is now, I think, on the table, a question that needs to be looked at, which is how do national constitutions, how have the member states in their national constitutions addressed the position of the law of the European Union? I think it varies from country to country. Uh, the extent to which international treaties generally are given the force of law within uh, member states varies from member state to member state. And some like us have very specific constitutional provisions in respect of the European Union, others less so. So I think that's an area well worth further debate and further consideration. And pretending it'll go away won't make it go away. And it is therefore, I think, an issue that needs to be addressed. The second issue I want to throw out for consideration it is the position of national courts in respect of potential challenges to the rule of law in the national courts of other member states. Um, if we go back, as you mentioned uh, in introducing me, I was called to the bar in 1973, which is the exact year in which Ireland joined the then European Economic Community. And at that time, hardly anyone knew much about European Union law. I never studied it. Um, there were a few clever people over in the corner who were meant to know something about European Union law. And if by some curious mischance you needed to know something about it, you went and asked one of them. But of course, that picture has radically changed in the almost 50 years since. So that European Union law now uh, impinges in very many areas. Perhaps the one area where it is least so in Ireland is the criminal law area. Uh, precisely because of our protocol position under Protocol uh, 21. But even there, uh, we have exercised the opt-in which that protocol recognizes into the European arrest warrant system. And a daily part of the business of our courts, particularly the High Court, is backing warrants issued seeking request, the request for surrender from other member states uh, and executing those warrants subject to the very limited exceptions which the framework decision itself and some of the case law of the CJEU uh, uh, recognize. So in that very real way, 
the Irish courts are required to respect the request for surrender made by a, a competent judicial authority in another member state. But it goes far beyond that. It, 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 the Brussels to this regulation provides for all sorts of ways in which in civil and commercial, analogously in, in family law matters, um, courts of one member state are required to recognize the decision of the courts of another member state, or maybe required to stay proceedings before their own court in favor of another court having jurisdiction over the matter, can frequently have to stay proceedings because another court is the court designated to decide which court should make the decision. Um, in an area as different as insolvency, we have the insolvency regulation, which requires that a single court have overall responsibility for all corporate response, uh, insolvency matters with other national courts only dealing with minor tangential issues. So in that whole range of areas across the daily work of national courts, we are required to respect, enforce uh, decisions of other member states, of course. And it seems to me that that provides a, a, a very vital reason why it is a matter of legitimate interest to us to be concerned about the extent to which the rule of law properly applies in, in, those, in those other member states. And not only for the general reason that obviously how things are in other member states are, are of concern to all citizens of Europe, and not only for the slightly more particular reason that those in the legal community obviously have a particular concern with how the legal community in another member state is operating. But it has the very real potential to impact upon us. For if we are being asked and required as a matter of union law to, in effect, enforce decisions of other member states and not second guess uh, what the judge in that other member state decided, then that has the potential to affect confidence in our courts if there are real questions about whether the rule of law applies properly in those member states. And I would go so far as to say we're obliged to enforce the decisions of other courts, even though we mightn't think they're right. But ultimately, every legal system needs some court that makes the final call. And if European Union law says that's a German court or a Spanish court, then we have to respect that just as we would hope that they would respect it, respect our decision if European Union law uh, said that our decision uh, was the one which had to be respected. So that is why it is a matter, I think, of very real and legitimate concern to national courts. Of course, we need to be mindful of the fact that the structures of courts, the way in which judges are appointed, the way in which judges are removed, uh, and many of the other matters that can impact on the separation of powers and the rule of law differ very significantly from one country to another. Uh, and measures that may seem strange to us because they're different from the way we do it may work perfectly well in another member state. I always quote the example of constitutional courts. The Italian constitutional court, for example, consists of 15 judges. Five of them are appointed by the president of the republic. Five of them are elected by the college of judges and five of them are elected by the parliament. That seems rather strange to us, but nonetheless, that's a system that is, as I would understand it, well respected in the Italian regime. The judges of Abundus of Assunsbury, perhaps the, the leading constitutional court in Europe, are elected by the parliament with a sort of qualified majority. That means that the judges elected must at least have a, a broad acceptance across much, perhaps not all, of the political range. Um, it's interesting that the current president uh, of the Conseil Constitutionnel in France uh, is a former Prime Minister of France, Laurent Fabius. So structures are different in different countries, and we shouldn't jump to the assumption that just because it's different, uh, there is a problem with the rule of law. But that doesn't mean that there aren't fundamental principles uh, that do apply. And where those fundamental principles are undermined so that there are real questions that a reasonable person reasonable knowledge of the situation would not trust the independence of the court, then that is what brings the system into potential disrepute. And it is a disrepute that can extend not just 
uh, to those in the country where that problem happens, but in all other member states whose courts are required to respect and enforce the judgments of those courts. So I think that's a real issue that requires uh, serious action. It also requires, I think, careful debate about what are those parameters that truly affect the rule of law and the avoidance of the impression that just because it's different to the way we do it, there must be something wrong with it. I think we perhaps don't have a sufficiently wide understanding of other systems that work perfectly well and thereby an ability to understand that just because it's different, there isn't a problem. But within that question, we also need to understand where there is a problem to identify it and to seek to take action to ensure that that problem is ameliorated to the greatest extent possible. There are no easy answers, I think, to these questions, but I think they're questions that need to be faced for the future of the European Union. We need to face the first question I asked, which is the different views which may be held of the primacy of European Union law as a matter of the constitutions of national courts. And we also need to face questions surrounding where we truly draw the line uh, at the independence of the courts. What are mere differences in culture on the one hand, and what are differences that really go to the root of the separation of powers on the other? Uh, I don't have easy answers to any of those questions, but I think there are questions which we really do need to consider in greater detail than perhaps in the past, because they do fundamentally affect the coherence of the European legal states. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, um, um, uh, Chief Justice, for, for um, uh, uh, addressing uh, the Institute and uh, uh, um, addressing those very serious um, uh, questions uh, so crucial uh, to the importance or to the to the future rather um, of the European Union and uh, indeed in their own way I think it's fair to say and um, even more crucial uh, than the than the issue of Brexit um, uh, has, uh, has 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 been um, now we've we've a number of questions appearing um, on the uh, the question feed uh, at, uh, at this stage so we'd uh, encourage uh, people to to keep going on that we have about half an hour to to deal with those questions so we'll we'll have a look at uh, some of them um, I see um, Dan O'Brien. Um, um, uh, who's here uh, in the Institute, uh, has uh, put uh, one uh, question, which I think is, uh, is very pertinent, and that is um, the frequency with which national courts are questioning supremacy uh, seems to be uh, increasing. Um, we've, we've had, of course, the, the Polish judgment there recently. We've had, the, um, uh, we've had the German one. And of course, you mentioned other ones as well. I, I think you referen uh, referred obliquely to the, the, we'd say the Danish and the Italian courts uh, as well uh, when you spoke. So the, 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 the frequency seems to be increasing. Is there a ready explanation for this? Why, why is this happening, um, do you think, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at this stage? <clears throat> that is, as I say, a hard question. Firstly, <laughs> I, I, would, I would agree with Dan that there does, well, I haven't seen any um, numeric consideration. I, I, I certainly have the impression that he is correct in the premise of his question, that there has been an increasing frequency. Um, I, I'm minded to quote the slightly irreverent comment attributed to Warren Buffett, which was to the effect that we only see who's been swimming without their togs on when the tide goes out. <laughs> I think when things are operating happily uh, and there's no great practical challenge, then these issues perhaps just don't emerge. Uh, they're much more likely to emerge where there are issues of very great controversy between member states and uh, the European Court. And I'm also, this is perhaps a side point, but it's a point that I think is worth throwing in the mix here. The thing that always interests me is the fact that we've now enshrined in the European treaties the principle of subsidiarity, even though it was spoken of prior to Lisbon, it's now there in black and white, um, in a very prominent position at the, the commencement of the Treaty of the European Union. A very interesting contrast between the case law of the European Court and that of the United States Supreme Court is the fact that so far as I'm aware, there has never been a case where a measure of the European Union legislature has been struck down as invalid on the basis of breaching the principle of subsidiarity. It is the daily meat of constitutional litigation in the United States where there is a constant debate 
about whether measures are within the competence of the federal authorities on the one hand or the states on the other hand. Uh, Obamacare, the great case about the validity of Obamacare, was not about whether it breached anyone's rights or was a good thing or a bad thing. It was about whether there was constitutional permission for the federal courts to do that. Um, ultimately, Obamacare survived, but the usual debates in the states around things like the Commerce Clause or taxation provisions or the like, and whether they justify a measure. And it just interests me that regularly that is the center of debate in US constitutional case law. And it hasn't really featured in Europe. Perhaps the reason is up to now, most European legislation has gone through by consensus. While we do have qualified majority voting, it, it seems to rarely feature as a practical matter because things tend to get sorted at the level of the Council of Ministers and perhaps sorted again in negotiation between the Council and the Parliament before the legislation is passed. So we've had a sort of consensual model whereby most measures of the European Union were ultimately done by consensus. And there therefore wasn't opposition by member states of any great extent to the decisions that were being taken. But perhaps that is now changing. And that may mean that people are exploring ways in which uh, that lack of consensus can be challenged. And I always feel what leads to litigation of one sort or another requires two things. One, that people are against something or in favor of something and want to enforce it through the courts. And secondly, that there's some at least vaguely respectable legal basis for the contention that they might want to put forward. Um, I think probably the legal basis was always there, but the desire to bring that kind of litigation perhaps wasn't there. But I think the less consensual model that exists nowadays may uh, increase the amount of occasions when people will challenge. Remember that the challenge that led to the Bundesverfassung's correct decision was brought by, I think, some legal and uh, economic uh, academics. Uh, so there were people out there who were concerned about what was happening. They brought the challenge uh, and it succeeded in part. But you needed the people to be annoyed about the thing in the first place to bring the case. So I think it needs both the desire uh, and the legal basis. And as I mentioned earlier, the legal basis, I think, was there all along. And the court had said that earlier. But perhaps there wasn't too much appetite for bringing the cases in the past. Interesting. That's that's uh, certainly a, a very interesting um, take on it. Um, um, uh, we've had some fascinating questions coming in here. I, I, I noticed that um, um, uh, Catherine Day, the former Secretary General of the European Commission and uh, an IIEA board member, uh, has put forward an interesting question. She thanks you for a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, and she asks, um, do you think the issues of primacy and the rule of law should be taken up the next time the treaties are renegotiated? Or would this merely open a can of worms that might lead to worse outcomes? Mm, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I suspect there'll be lots of them. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we, we saw what happened when there was an attempt to create the European Constitution. I, I, I know one could describe Lisbon as Constitution light in that it had a lot of the practical measures that were to be in the Constitution uh, yeah. without giving it the sort of grandiose title of a Constitution. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is an interesting fact when, you know, that failed in uh, referendums in both France and, and the Netherlands. So, I mean, it, it's interesting that primacy is a construct of the court, not directly of the treaties. For the reasons I indicated earlier, I think European Union law has to recognize primacy, but still, I, I wonder, would you get it through? Um, we wouldn't have to change our model at all because we've done it already. But if you were to put up a treaty change that conferred primacy or indeed dealt with the rule of law and given the requirement for unanimity. Um, I think it would be desirable if it could be done, but I would seriously question whether it would be practical politics uh, to achieve it. Um, and it might well be that the can of worms analogy uh, is the more uh, correct view as to what would be likely to happen. 
<laughs> Excellent. Yes. I mean, it might be better to ask the question if you don't want the answer. Is <laughs> perhaps another way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, um, uh, moving on then, um, Eleanor uh, Burnhill of uh, RTE has uh, posed an interesting question, and, and I suppose it's one that relates really to what's going on um, in relation to Poland um, at the moment. And uh, the question uh, is: uh, Are fines of up to one million euro per day likely to win over national populations? Or could there be more persuasive mechanisms? Uh, and can the EU do more to ensure the separation of judicial and political power? I'm not quite sure what she's referring to with the, with the, the latter question, but uh, so are fines uh, likely to win over national populations or could there be more persuasive mechanisms? And secondly, can the EU do more to ensure the separation of judicial and uh, political power? Um, one would wonder whether a fine even of that level um, has a huge effect. Uh, I mean, even for a country of the size of Ireland, uh, 365 million euro a year, that's not insignificant, but it's, you know, what is it, probably uh, a small fraction of the Irish annual budget, um, less than 1%. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the GDP uh, of Poland is, but it's in population terms, eight times as big as us. So uh, its GDP must be a, a multiple of ours. So uh, I'm not sure they have a huge effect, but then one of the problems here is we're sailing in somewhat uncharted legal waters as to what remedies there are for these problems. Uh, the treaties don't have absolutely explicit uh, measures that can be adopted. One of the problems, of course, is that the easy way of dealing with it would be a measure adopted under the treaties by all of the other member states. But as long as you have two member states that aren't uh, towing what would be perceived to be the Brussels line, then the practical possibility of adopting those measures, which are the only ones expressly recognized in the treaties, uh, is no longer there. Um, and so it's really, I think, a question of the Commission in particular, but also the other institutions trying to be creative about legal remedies where there aren't ready-made legal remedies. Um, I think to be effective, it needs to be more than a fine of a million a day, but exactly what is legally permissible is itself a question. And you don't want to enforce the rule of law by breaking the rule of law yourself. So there does need to be uh, a proper legal basis for any measures which are adopted. Uh, and that isn't necessarily very easy. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, um, uh, the uh, Noel Dorr, um, uh, um, uh, well known in, in, in having a, a role in negotiating uh, mm -hmm. uh, many of the treaties uh, we're, we're discussing, um, uh, raises a very pertinent uh, question, um, and he thanks you again for a very interesting presentation. Um, he asks, could Judge Clark elaborate uh, on the important difference between the judgments uh, of the, Pol the German courts, uh, and I assume here he's referring to the vice judgment, which we refer to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and the Polish court, um, and again, I assume he's referring to the judgment of the 7th of October uh, of yeah. the Polish Constitutional Court. There's a problem in doing that because all we know, certainly all I know, and so far as I'm aware, all anyone outside those directly involved know, is a relatively short statement from the Polish court, which gave the answer without uh, going into detail as to the reasoning for it. Mm. Uh, the German court gave, as is its wont, a, a very detailed and reasoned argument. Whether you agree with it or not, you can at least clearly follow the reasoning. And as I understand it, I don't claim to be an expert in German constitutional law, so I could get this wrong. But as I understand it, from having spoken to some German colleagues, essentially, the reasoning of the German court goes something like this. Um, <clears throat> The whole point of constitutions is that they limit the power of both government and parliament. Government and parliament can only operate within the limits of the constitution. And therefore, neither the parliament in uh, enacting legislation or the government in entering into treaties has the power to break the constitution. And if you leave aside European Union law altogether for the moment, it would, I think, be axiomatic in most constitutional regimes that if the government entered into a treaty 
which the constitution didn't permit it to enter into, the courts would quite properly say that treaty is not binding in whatever way it, it might be binding in national law. Um, and the theory behind the German judgment, as I understand it, is that there were therefore limits to the extent to which the Polish parliament, or sorry, the German parliament, or the German uh, government could, as it were, override the German constitution. Uh, and that formed the legal basis for the analysis that led to their view that the European Court of Justice got it wrong uh, in approving of the methods adopted uh, for, for the, the bond selling uh, by the, the ECB. Now, whatever you think about the merits of the specific decision, there's a certain logic and at least the principle behind it. Um, whether the Polish court took a similar line of reasoning or what line of reasoning it took it isn't particularly clear, other than that it asserted that European Union law didn't override the Polish constitution. So it's not clear whether there's a difference between the two. Um, and I don't know the detail of the extent of any to which um, the position of Poland within the European Union is recognized in the Polish constitution as opposed to in Polish law. And therefore it's very difficult to compare the two. Um, if we had a detailed reasoned judgment from the Polish a constitutional tribunal, then we might at least be able to compare them. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for that, uh, Chief Justice. Um, uh, Kate McCurry, uh, who's a journalist with the Press Association, has posed a, a question to, on, on a related topic, really. Um, do you think the EU should take stronger action um, against member states whose courts come to the finding that their constitution is supreme to European Union law? Um, uh, so that's one question she asks. She actually asks two. Now, I understand uh, that proceedings are being brought against Germany um, under Article 258. I'm not sure what the position is in relation to um, uh, the, the, the Polish um, Constitutional Court judgment, but I'd be very surprised if that isn't followed up uh, with similar proceedings. Uh, so I'm not sure what the EU could do stronger than that, but I, I leave that question to you. And then the second question she asks is, um, uh, do the findings of German uh, and Polish courts water down the supremacy uh, of European Union law? So should the EU take stronger action against uh, states um, uh, um, uh, who, who uh, reach primacy uh, findings of that kind? And secondly, do the findings of German and Polish courts water down the supremacy of European Union law? Well, I think my answer to question one is exactly the answer you gave yourself, <laughs> which is uh, th th there are infringement proceedings uh, already in being against Germany. And I think this again brings into focus one of the key points I was trying to make in response to the first question I posed. Um, whatever may be the position in German constitutional law, the law of the European Union recognizes primacy. That's what we all signed up to when we joined the European Union. So as a matter of Union law, it would appear that Germany is in breach. And of course, from the perspective of the Union, a country encompasses all of its institutions. It's not just its courts, it's its governments, it's its parliaments. So if collectively, the position of a country is in breach of European Union law, then that country is in breach and can be the subject of, of um, infringement proceedings and therein being, um, I suppose we shouldn't prejudge what decision the Court of Justice will take, uh, but I, I think that certainly has to be the first step. Um, but it does raise this, uh, perhaps a second degree question. Well, let's say the European Court says, uh, yes, that's a breach of European Union law. Country X is in breach because its courts have done this. What happens next? You're back to the question we had. Uh, and what if the, I, mean, I recollect that this is a very different issue, but it's one that I was personally involved in way back in, in the 1990s when I was involved before the European Court of Human Rights in the Open Door case. I represented Open Door, and if you remember, that case was about uh, the fact that the Irish court, relying on the Eighth Amendment, had imposed injunctions on uh, agencies like Open Door and the Well Woman Clinic against giving information and making travel arrangements for women who wished to avail of terminations, in, mainly in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and that was the position under the Irish Constitution, and there would have been a very hard question if things didn't develop in the way they did. We had the X case, we had a somewhat change in public opinion. We had two amendments introduced 
solve the problem. But you could have a very difficult situation if there is a national constitution that says one thing, but the state of whom that is the constitution is found to be in breach of European Union law because of the implementation of that constitution itself. Uh, what's to happen? Um, that's very uncharted water. And it, depending on the mechanisms for amending the constitution, that may not be so easy. I mean, imagine it happened in our case. Imagine something, if we didn't have Article 29 and conferring supremacy on the European, uh, on European Union law in the Irish constitution, and we were found to be in breach of European Union law because of something in the Irish constitution. And the government said, oh, we're very sorry and we'll try and amend it. And the government proposed an amendment and the people say, no, what happens then? It, you're getting into very difficult territory. And I think the underlying reason for it is that the way in which member states have recognized at a constitutional level the position of the European Union within their national legal order differs. And no one really thought too much about that before recent times. Uh, and it may be that it's not politically feasible to make the kind of amendments that would solve that problem. I'm sorry, I've forgotten what the second question was. Um, my goodness me, I'm afraid I've forgotten what the second, second question was myself at this stage. Um, um, oh yes, can the European Union do more to uh, ensure the separation of judicial and political power? Was that it? Or, um, I think, um, um, sorry, I beg your pardon, no it wasn't. That was a, a previous question or second mm -hmm. question. Um, uh, this, uh, the second question was, do the findings of German and Polish courts water down the supremacy of European Union law? Well, they, they certainly do from the perspective of the national constitutions of those countries, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as a matter of European Union law, it is clear that a, a member state is required, or the courts of a member state are required to disapply uh, national laws, including national constitutional laws, which conflict with European Union law. And an example of that was in the industrial relations field was the answer the Court of Justice gave to a reference from the Irish courts concerning the position of the uh, Industrial Relations Commission where it was effectively required that we disapply provisions of the Irish constitution to enable that body to have jurisdiction over a certain category of case. So that's if the clear position as a matter of European Union law. But the hard question is, what happens then when national constitutions don't recognise that primacy in a complete way? Uh, but it does water it down, certainly. Indeed, yes. I, I think an additional complication, of course, was posed uh, in the, the German case uh, by the fact that uh, um, some of the interpretation provided by the, the German Constitutional Court purported to be uh, of articles in the German Constitution which are unamendable, um, which uh, renders a, a, puts in an, an, an even extra level of, uh, of complication uh, of, of complication there. But, um, well, indeed, uh, it might well require a referendum in Germany to create a different type of constitution if you were to do that but that is a problem that's absolutely absolutely um okay um so let me see uh, just um uh, looking for further questions there um uh, yes uh, we have one from a uh, former uh, irish ambassador uh, to the uh, united kingdom bobby mcdonough uh, and uh, uh, he seeks to tempt you he says could you be tempted to say a word about the rule of law in the united kingdom uh, uh, for example about the justice secretary indicating that uh, consideration be given to a law to permit the government to override court decisions or the earlier formal announcement of an intention to break international law? Um, well, uh, probably eight weeks ago when I was Chief Justice, I wouldn't have been <laughs> tempted, but temptation <laughs> is um, harder to resist given my new, new status. Uh, and uh, I think I, I, I'll at least go a little way along Bobby's temptation. <laughs> um, Firstly, I suppose one has to say uh, it remains to be seen what measures are actually adopted. Um, I, I remember having a discussion with uh, a senior English judge a few years ago who said that what the sort of right leaning press didn't fully realize was that most of the decisions that they didn't like were actually made by judges in London, not by judges in Strasbourg or judges in Luxembourg, um, with the possible exception of the prisoner's vote case. 
and that maybe when they found that out, uh, there might be bigger trouble, hence enemies of the people and the like. Uh, <clears throat> um, I mean, some measures perhaps uh, mightn't be a particular uh, problem with the rule of law. Um, breaching international law has always been in a slightly different category to breaching the rule of law per se. But certainly if some of the, how should I describe it, more exotic proposals that seem to be coming from some ministers in the current regime in the United Kingdom were to find their way into law, I think they would raise questions. Um, you know, uh, obviously, the ability to overturn a decision of the courts is not necessarily in itself a problem if it's done properly. For example, if the courts interpret a law in a particular way and the government doesn't like it and can propose validly an amendment to that law so that it now clearly means something different, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what happens all the time. Even occasionally, we have had constitutional amendments that were designed to reverse decisions of the court. Going back to the very ones I mentioned, uh, rising out of open door and the like, there were decisions of the Supreme Court as to what uh, the Eighth Amendment meant. There were then further amendments that altered that decision. So that in itself is not a problem. But if you're actually just simply trying to overturn a decision, saying we don't like that decision and it is hereby no longer the decision and something else is the decision. I think that's a fundamental breach of the separation of powers and would be a serious attack on the rule of law. Perhaps even more direct, a more direct attack than those which are criticized in some countries where you don't change the decisions, but you change the judges in the hope that the new judges will come up with different decisions. But to actually directly change the decisions as well uh, would I think be quite a direct attack on the rule of law. But whether they go ultimately go down that route is perhaps another day's work and we'll have to see what actually happens rather than what people threaten might happen. One sometimes could be forgiven for thinking that some of this is just playing to a certain constituency uh, and what will actually manifest itself in real change uh, may not be quite as clear as the rhetoric might suggest. Right. Well, let's hope those particular dogs bark uh, for, for longer than they, than they choose to bite. Um, we're coming very close to the end at this stage, and I must apologise, we're, we're actually getting lots and lots of questions, and it's, it's just really not possible to reach all of them. But uh, uh, perhaps if I just take this last one, as I said, with apologies to anyone who hasn't managed to, to um, uh, whose question we haven't managed to arrive at, um, uh, Mary Carolyn uh, of the Irish uh, Times asks uh, whether you have any proposals uh, for how the EU might best address the problem of some national governments engaging uh, in what many regard as serious interference with the independence of their judiciaries. Um, uh, we have two minutes left. Uh, so, um, um, I, don't know if you can... <laughs> I, I think if there were easy answers to that, they would have already been thought of and would have been applied. <laughs> and, and I go back to the problem with, you know, you, you can't solve problems with the rule of law by breaking the rule of law yourself. So the European institutions have to themselves comply with European Union law in whatever measures they try and adopt. And the absence of there being clear and easily implementable measures um, is itself part of the problem. So I, I don't think there is a, any easy proposals. Um, if you are engaged in wishful thinking, you might ask for um, different treaties that might uh, provide for more uh, easily implementable and effective remedies mm. but I'm not sure that they're there and I'm not sure in the current climate it'd be possible to put them in um, I did hear one slightly interesting proposal made at a recent conference in, in Warsaw um, where the speaker who is himself a judge said that he appreciated this is a kind of a lawyer's answer but nonetheless he put it forward he said well the following could happen uh, if, if one country just really won't comply with the rules that all the other countries want to comply with. All of the other countries could serve notice under the treaties to leave the European Union and set up European Union too by themselves and, and leave the other country by itself in the original European Union. I suspect 
for about a thousand legal complications in attempting to do that. And I doubt if there be, would be the political will to do it. But I think we're just stuck with the treaty architecture we have. And that does provide some solutions, but perhaps not ones which are as ideal as one might like. OK, well, let's hope in due course these problems go away by themselves, perhaps with a little help from the electorate in the, in the relevant uh, countries. But uh, until then, uh, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to wait and, and see. Chief Justice, this has been a veritable intellectual feast. Uh, you've raised really, really important questions. Um, uh, and I have to say, I enjoyed the, the, uh, the discussion uh, enormously. Thank you so much for having uh, given up your time to be with us uh, here today. Uh, and um, uh, thank you also to everyone in the audience uh, for, for uh, having joined us uh, and uh, to uh, the very many of you uh, who pose questions, whether we manage to get to them uh, or not. Uh, we look forward uh, to seeing you uh, in the Institute again uh, on some uh, future uh, occasion. Um, uh, and uh, we're delighted to have, have you uh, uh, to have had have you to have had you here with us um, uh, today. Thank you very much indeed.